And today I'd like to present a synopsis of scholarship aimed at uh, the story of Jesus' parable on the Good Samaritan. Found in Luke chapter 10, my sources include two books written by one of the foremost experts in the first century culture, Dr. Kenneth Bailey. Dr. Bailey, given his 40 years residence in the Middle East, speaks to the cultural aspects that were prevalent in the first century. I also leaned on Lucan commentaries from Kay Snodgrass and Luke Timothy Johnson. Other Jewish scholarship also informed my understanding of the backdrop of the discussion between you know, the teacher of the law and Jesus. I've included references on this front page to my primary sources. So where to start? Let's uh, read the situation that prompted the story and we'll begin in Luke chapter 10, um, 25 through 29. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied, do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? All right, let's first identify the role of a teacher of the law. And from here on, I'll refer to them just as a lawyer. You know, after the Babylonian exile, teachers of the law came into the Jewish religious think tank with a primary role to develop, teach, and apply the Old Testament law. Their role initially was that of a scribe whose duties were more uh, strictly secretarial. You know, the prophet Ezra is the first mention of someone embodying this role, and that's found in Ezra chapter 7. Now think um, of how you have heard or interpreted the, uh, the motives of this lawyer. Most of us would probably frame this lawyer as aggressive and trying to trap Jesus in his words. You know, antagonistic or not, this dialogue between Jesus and him was very much appropriate. It was very typical within the dynamics of legal rabbinic debate, where Jesus responds to his first question with a question, then follows the next question with a story. The lawyer's posture of standing to address Jesus and addressing him as teacher also points to more humility. Of course, other scholar, excuse me, other scholars can easily see this as adversarial, and there may be some sense of opposition with his intention, you know, to test. And that word stems from the Greek word ekperezo, which can intimate aggression. You know, regardless, it doesn't change the emphasis really of the parable. So the lawyer asks, "What must I do to inherit eternal life?" You know, this question should seem familiar. Later in Luke 18, the same exact question is asked by a rich young ruler. In both cases, to us, this question, you know, it really does look flawed from a Western perspective. What can anyone do to inherit anything? In that culture, however, this question could be explained by the patron-client system that was prevalent at that time. In a recent Bema Discipleship podcast, L. Grover Fricks discussed how inheritance language fits, uh, you know, into patronage. So it was very appropriate for this question to be asked. Where the patriarch is God, whose hand, who hands out inheritances, this lawyer may uh, want to have known how he can walk out his calling in a way to gain this inheritance. In any case, this question didn't bother Jesus. He did not respond negatively toward the young ruler or toward this lawyer in asking this question. You know, really, so we, we shouldn't either. A brief comment on a Jewish perspective of eternal life. The concept of their belief in, in eternity um, stems from the Genesis account where God breathed life into man. In the Jewish mind, this spark of divine breath first lived in a heavenly being before it entered our bodies and ultimately, in the end, will return with the departed to these same heavenly realms. 
There are also Old Testament echoes of eternity or afterlife. For example, we see in the story of Enoch where he was taken up to God before his death and where God informs Abraham that at his death he will depart to his fathers in peace. In Jewish eschatology, the process of transitioning from Helom Hazeh, this world, to Helom Haba, um, or the world to come, developed after 200 BCE. I probably have butchered the way to say those names. This may be what the lawyer was referring to when he asked this question. So back to the question, the lawyer asked, what must I do? Where the word do comes from this Greek word on the screen here, it translates literally into what having done. This is an action verb and is in what's called the aorist tense, referring to an action in the past. This term, however, is difficult to translate within the sentence. The Greek literally reads, what having done will I inherit eternal life? So most translators chose to let it read, what must I do, which assumes a future action. Three translations, Young's Literal, Darby, and Disciples Literal New Testament translations, render this rendition as the Greek states. So the lawyer is not asking what future actions must he do. Instead, he is looking at past accomplishments to justify his entry into eternal life. Jesus, in response, states in verse 28, do this and you will live. This is a current active status of doing, from the Greek uh, word poiai, where the verb form is called a present imperative, or just present tense. In essence, keep on doing. Also, Jesus expands the concept of eternal life beyond that of heaven only to life lived currently. All right, and let's spend a moment looking at the question Jesus asks in response to the lawyer's question regarding eternal life. Jesus responds with two questions. The first is a question he asks stating what is written generally a question not that difficult to answer. However, the second question he asked, how do you read it? Or what is your interpretation? We would know this as what is your hermeneutic? The Greek word for read is agonisko, <laughs> which suggests reading aloud publicly which is in practice within Jewish community would identify his position on this topic. What we notice is that the lawyer only answers Jesus's first question, the easier of the two, quoting the Shema from Deuteronomy 6.5 with the addition of mind, along with Leviticus 19.18 about loving one's neighbor as oneself. He doesn't speak toward the second question regarding his interpretation or hermeneutic. That's what he is prompting Jesus to address. Basically, what are his thoughts on this matter? So finally, before we enter the parable, the lawyer asks, who is my neighbor? Here he's engaging in the rabbinical debate over the interpretation of Leviticus 19, 33 and 34 on whether the word foreigner implies a pagan Gentile, or a Jewish proselyte. You know, that verse reads in Leviticus 19, the foreigner residing among you must be treated as your native born. Love them as yourself, for you were foreigners in Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Lois Torverg makes an interesting comment on the Hebraic term neighbor, which is spelled out here stating that the core element rea, which we translate as neighbor, to a Jew meant companion, fellow, kinsman, or friend. She mentions that this lawyer likely assumed that rea extended beyond one's closest friends. But how far? Remember his question again, who is my neighbor? We will see how Jesus answers this question at the end of the parable. Now, to the parable. 
Have you ever thought how Jesus, when prompted in these particular situations, is able to provide these beautifully constructed stories? You know, let's read an Old Testament story that amazingly parallels the story of the Good Samaritan. We might entitle this as the Good Israelites in Samaria. So, a little background. God was displeased with King Ahaz and the Judeans who resided in the southern kingdom of Judah for dabbling in idolatry. He used Israelites in Samaria to inflict heavy casualties during a battle. However, they went well beyond their mission. They enslaved over 200,000 Judeans along with plunder that they took. Then they returned to Samaria. God was displeased by their overexertion as victors and confronted them through a prophet. Here we pick up a story as to their reaction. This is Second Chronicles 28, 9-15. Then some of the leaders in Ephraim confronted those who were arriving from war. You must not bring those prisoners here, they said, or we will be guilty before the Lord. Do you intend to add to our sin and guilt, for our guilt is already great, and his fierce anger rests on Israel. So the soldiers gave up the prisoners and plunder in the presence of the officials and all the assembly. The men designated by name took the prisoners, and from the plunder they clothed all who were naked. They provided them with clothes and sandals, food and drink, and healing balm. All those who were weak they put on donkeys. So they took them back to their fellow Israelites at Jericho, the city of Palms, and returned to Samaria. In verse 15, these Israelites say they clothed the naked, they fed them, provided healing balm, then put them on donkeys and returned them to Jericho. This story reads of compassion and incredible acts of kindness and mercy. You know, this is somewhat astounding between these two nations that have been at odds over each other for a while. Their response also hinted at them treating their prisoners at royalty by anointing them with oil and putting them on donkeys. This was seen in 1 Kings chapter 1, 38-39. This historical moment must have resonated with those in hearing this parable that Jesus now presented. For the same sequence of treatment of these prisoners was threaded through the parable Jesus had constructed. Jesus, you know, he really was a master at drawing in his listeners to stories that had echoes of other ancient stories. Let's read from Luke 10, 30 through 35. In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw the man. He passed by on the other side. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. All right, let's look at all the characters in the story one by one. First, the unidentified man. He is only specified as the man. Robbers had hidden and then attacked this individual. This image that I'm showing now shows a portion of the road to Jericho. And you can see that there were many areas in the serpentine winding road where it bends here and there where others could hide uh, who were bent on malice and they could surprise a traveler. This man, he's left naked and unconscious. You know, you know what, why is this important to the story? 
Bailey observes that the, his family of origin cannot be identified. You know, think how clothing is a good indicator of where a person is from, as is a person's speech or dialect. Jesus purposely, I believe, keeps this individual's nationality neutral to test the actions of these three individuals. A few clues as to why a listener of this story would expect the three main characters to be uh, the following. They would expect a priest, a Levite, and a Jewish layperson. These three classes of people officiated at the temple and would have been expected to have traveled the 17-mile road to Jericho after their two weeks of service officiating before God and the people. Most of the 24 orders of priests lived in Jericho. They belonged to a hereditary guild and were very likely wealthy. The Levites were temple assistants to these priests. So first the priests came down the road and saw the man, but passed on the other side. You know why? You know, possibly to avoid uh, becoming unclean. Levitical law stated that anyone who came in contact with a dead body uh, required undergoing the process of purification. Priests who became ritually unclean would be required to stand at the eastern gate in front of the altar while a gong was sounded proclaiming their status of their uncleanliness. Leviticus 19 calls for a period of uncleanness for seven days during which the priests would be sprinkled with water for purification. However, this seems like just a minor inconvenience. Think about how minor inconveniences can keep us engaging from engaging with those in need. It really is never anything major, just our own selfishness. Okay, so you know, back to the interaction on the road to Jericho. The priest, assumed wealthy, had the financial means to render aid to this man, yet chose not to. And he would understand that the highest calling for a Torah-following Jew was to save a life. Yet here he continues on to Jericho. Okay, so the Levite follows. What about him? The text says that he came to that place, saw the man, then passed by. So he did more than the priest did. He approached the man, then left, much like a process we call in the United States as rubbernecking. So rubbernecking is a is slowing down on the road while driving to look at an accident with no intention of stopping to help. The Levite also had means of rendering aid. You know, it's conjecture, but based on the large field of view and the possibility that these two work together at the temple, and given the seriousness of the man's wounds that the Levite was able to see the response of his colleague in front of him. You know, whatever the issues, the Levite chose not to help. Now remember, the lawyer and those listening to the story would be expecting the final participant to be a Jewish layperson. I think to his shock, Jesus mentions a third figure as a Samaritan. The shock had to be felt from him and the other listeners, and, and why? Samaritans were viewed uh, negatively by Jews. To get a feel for the hatred, here's a quote from the Mishnah. He that eats the bread of the Samaritans is like the one that eats the flesh of swine. Not very complimentary. There are many other similar recorded musings about this group of people. Jumping to the end of the story, we even see the attitude of the lawyer not even being able to mention the name Samaritan when Jesus asks him to identify which of the three were truly a neighbor. You know, he simply states that the one who had mercy on him. To add fuel to the fire, Jewish attitudes toward the Samaritans just 20 years earlier, um, a, a group of them, a group of Samaritans, entered the temple and scattered bones throughout the area during Passover defiling the temple during one of the three most holy festivals. You know, I think about it, 20 years ago, America was terrorized by Al-Qaeda. When Al-Qaeda flew planes into buildings in New York and D.C. and crashing a plane into the Pennsylvania countryside. You know, this event is still very palpable even today that um, some Americans have been dealing with feelings of mistrust and hatred towards those of Arab descent. 
Yet, you know, there was there was something more contentious, contentious than um, the Samaritans being viewed as as half breeds for intermarrying, while most of the Jewish population was carried off into Babylonian exile. The Samaritans saw that those in exile had diluted the Torah to a series of extra rules that were documented in the Babylonian Talmud. They saw themselves, the Samaritans did, as keepers of the true Torah. I think it was this posture that created the most enmity <laughs> say that, between themselves and the Jews. Finally, we get to the point where Jesus focuses in on the actions of this Samaritan. You know, the contrast here is striking. Here, the Samaritan also saw the man, as did the priest and Levite. He came to him, as did the Levite. But then he acted unlike the other two. Also, the Samaritan was in the region of Judea, and the unidentified man he encountered was, was most likely a Jew. You know, what moved him into action? You know, look at verse 33 where the text states that he took pity on him. You know, this word for pity, I'm not going to pronounce it. It's up on the screen. Um, splanch, no, I am going to pronounce it. Splanch nozomai. In the Greek term meaning compassion, it is derived from the root splanchnon, meaning innards or guts. This is a very strong word. In essence, the Samaritan was moved tremendously through seeing which prompted him to act. You know, the Hebrew equivalent is um, this word rahem, or womb. It is the female image for nurturing, giving space to grow, compassion. Very powerful word. Okay, let's look at the aid he provides this man. He treated the man with what he had, oil for cleaning and softening the wounds, wine to disinfect, then bandages to stop the bleeding. Jesus' use of pouring on wine and oil also may have alluded to the temple duties just done by the priest and Levite at the altar. So finally, the Samaritan proceeds down to Jericho, where he and the injured man stay overnight. You know, I can imagine him still treating the man into the late evening and into the early morning hours. The next day, he gets up and pays the innkeeper two denarii, an amount to cover two weeks of room and board, and, and he also, in essence, gives him carte blanche, his credit card, for extra expenses that might be incurred. He also states that this moment was not just a one-off, but would, would, re, would return to see this man's progress. You know, earlier we had seen Jesus challenging the lawyer with the thought of good deeds, not being based on events from our past, but much on a present-day basis. So, you know, what did the priest risk? Nothing. What did the Levite risk? Nothing. You know, what did the Samaritan risk? Really everything. He risked possible defilement in stopping to help this man. He risked exposure to the possibility of the bandits also overtaking him at that site. You know, as a sub-point, obviously this area was a place for such activity. You know, a few years ago, I was sitting in a car with another friend uh, driving in a part of Boston that was right on the fringe of a lot of criminal activity. You know, we were at a stoplight when we heard a series of gunshots immediately behind us. A car had pulled up to a car behind us and had shot through that window. You know, honestly, our first reaction was to get out of the area as fast as we could. My friend blew through the light but proceeded deeper into the dangerous area of town. My first instinct was not to render aid, but to get out of danger. All right. You know, back to the Samaritan. He was, what else was he at risk of? He was also at risk for retribution by the community or family once the man was to be identified. Here he was, a foreigner, a despised foreigner, with a severely injured man. If the man had died, he would not have been able to provide details on who his attackers were, obviously. Here, the Samaritan could have been accused. He placed himself at risk at all points. You know, just a summary, the Samaritan used all his available resources to render aid. 
the oil, the wine, the cloth, the donkey, his time, energy, money, life. You know, finally, Jesus states, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? You know, notice the shift in the question Jesus now presents versus the one the lawyer initially asked. You know, the lawyer initially asked, who is my neighbor? These are different questions. The impetus is not identifying who to help. That in individual is simply anyone. Rather, Jesus is telling him what a good neighbor looks like, one who sees, one who comes near, one who feels deeply, than one who does something. You know, look at the man's answer. In the NIV, the text reads, The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. You know, that verse, the verse translate this verb to do in the Greek as a continuity and not as a one-off. Literally, it reads, The one doing mercy to him. And you can see the Greek there. Notice how the lawyer has changed his understanding from deeds done to deeds current and ongoing. So what is our takeaway from this interaction? You know, what have we learned? A few bullet points. A person to be helped is not identified by the place they live, by their family of origin, or any other cultural, racial, economic label we typically define other by others by. Simply a person is in need, nothing more, nothing less. I think we learned too that eternal life extends to the living that we do right now. And then action towards others involves seeing, first seeing, then coming close, then acting. The actions of the Samaritan are much in line with how God responded to the cries of the Israelite slaves in Egypt. In Exodus 3, verses 7 and 8, it reads, You know, the Lord said, uh, I have indeed seen the misery of my people. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers. I am concerned about their suffering, so I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land. You know, being a neighbor is just, it's just being there. It's just showing up, seeing, feeling, and then being moved to action, doing something, doing anything. Jesus, you know, he looked at this lawyer and he said, you know, just, just show up. That's a neighbor, just showing up. And he is asking us to do the same. Thanks.